Ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Royal Society of Edinburgh for this discussion of Professor Geoffrey Stout's Gifford Lectures, entitled Religion Unbound, Ideals and Powers from Cicero to King. I'm Alison Elliott, and I'm a Fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh and an Honorary Fellow at the School of Divinity in Edinburgh University. The Royal Society of Edinburgh is Scotland's National Academy. It's an educational charity, independent and non-party political, and it's got over 1,500 fellows covering the full range of disciplines, science and technology, arts, humanities, social sciences, as well as having categories for business and public service. And it was founded in 1783. Now, those of us who have been lucky enough to attend Professor Stout's Gifford Lectures know what a serious joy they have been. Like all Gifford Lectures, Geoffrey Stout is a distinguished scholar. He's Professor of Religion at Princeton University and author of The Flight from Authority, Ethics After Babel, Democracy and Tradition, and Blessed Are the Organised. As well as editing academic journals and book series, he has form as an activist in the civil rights and anti-war movements. Unlike many Gifford lecturers, Professor Stout is a clear and thoughtful lecturer. <laughs> Leading, leading his audience sensitively this through... Is, this is being recorded. <laughs> yes, I'm prepared to defend it. <laughs> leading his audience very sensitively through complex arguments over the last 10 days. Now, it's probably too much to ask uh, Professor Stout to summarise his lectures in 10 minutes, uh, but I now invite him to introduce the discussion of his lectures. Professor Stout. Uh, uh, may I begin by thanking Allison, but also thanking the Royal Society for hosting this event. This is a very nice addition to the, to the two weeks. Um, may, may I ask by be, uh, at the beginning, how many of you have been to the lecture series, at least one or two? Okay, so that's, that's most of you. The question I chose to address in these lectures is, how would our understanding of religion and politics need to change if the religious voices in egalitarian freedom movements were given their due? So our historical understanding of how religion and politics have been related our philosophical understanding of what religion and politics are in one or another sense, our practical understanding of where we can go from here. In the background is a widely assumed framework that I have called the great separation story, a phrase I have borrowed from Mark Lilla's book, The Hidden God. According to the Great Separation story, religion and politics were not always separated, but became so wherever Enlightenment liberalism achieved hegemony. So-called liberals celebrate the separation of religion from politics as a triumph of reason and freedom over superstition and tradition, a victory imperiled nowadays according to the Great Separation uh, story in one of its versions, by a worrisome return of religion in the age of Falwell, Khomeini, Pope John Paul II, 9-11, Charlie Hebdo, and religiously legitimized nationalism in its current uh, forms. Opponents of liberalism often keep the three-stage narrative frame while inverting the valuations attached to each stage. Things used to be better, according to this version of the Great Separation story. Then came the liberal separation of religion from politics, which produced something called 
the modern conception of religion as essentially or ideally private. And now we are seeing various attempts to overthrow the resulting liberal political order with its deracinated secular reason, its leveling of excellence, its exodus from virtue, its privatization or evisceration of religion, and its reproduction of atomistic, homeless, anomic, emotivist, possessive, acquisitive, rights-demanding subjects. I've been calling all three stages of the Great Separation story into question and have shown no more sympathy for the anti-liberal version than for the liberal triumphalist one. Even the ambivalent and unusually subtle version developed in Charles Taylor's Gifford Lectures, which were published under the title of A Secular Age, it seems to me drastically underplays the extent of religious conflict and uncertainty in Europe before 1500 and neglects the task of investigating how religion talk arose in ancient Rome and developed in Christendom. Once we begin to fill in the pre-modern phase of the religion and politics story in a historically responsible way, what we find is a great deal of conflict, ethical and political conflict as well as theological conflict over religion. Religion as a virtue annexed to justice, distinguished from equity, grouped with piety as a virtue of acknowledged dependence, and contrasted with its semblance, superstition. The ethical and political conflict associated with religion, thus understood, has to do with differing conceptions of divinity, differing conceptions of the practical and institutional means for fulfilling a person's or a people's religious responsibilities, but also differing conceptions of the ethical dispositions and political relationships that religious practices ought to cultivate. Here we uh, found a recurring debate over how, if at all, one might go about loosing religion from the bounds of tyranny and oppression. With increasing attention, beginning in roughly 1200, to the issues of consensual governance and accountability as checks on arbitrary power. I've presented abolitionism and subsequent democratic freedom movements as the result of an egalitarian modification of a struggle for security from domination, and thus as con a, a somewhat continuous development of a tradition stretching back to ancient democracy and republicanism, among other sources. One implication of this conclusion is that the notion of freedom, primarily at work in egalitarian freedom movements, has not been the so-called liberal notion of freedom from interference introduced by Hobbes. And this means that the victories won by these movements should neither be credited to nor blamed on the triumph of liberal freedom, that is, the sort of freedom conceived as uh, non-interference. Once the egalitarian freedom movements are freed from the great separation story, we can take seriously the insistence of many modern freedom fighters that they are religiously motivated in their political work and firmly opposed to, se to secularism. This, in turn, should permit us also to see that the Great Separation is largely an ocular illusion suffered by individuals who spend their adult lives in the bureaucracies and universities, where the Great Separation story and the politics of lowered stakes have held sway. To say that there has been a Great Separation of religion from politics is equivalent to ignoring the ideas and organizational patterns of the egalitarian freedom movements since abolitionism. <clears throat> 
It is also to adopt a grossly oversimplified account of what happened in the various European Enlightenments. The separation of church from magistrate, where it has occurred, has not amounted to a separation of religion from politics. In the US, in particular, it helped open up the space in which free religious expression, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, and so forth, coalesced uh, in democratic reform movements, such as abolitionism, feminism, and civil rights. All of those reform movements, which were not merely a matter of tinkering with policy, but brought about and tried to bring about significant alterations in the balance of power in basic relationships in society. Given that these movements cover the entire period since Hume began writing philosophy, it doesn't make much sense to say that religion has recently returned. I conclude, therefore, that the great separation story is either false or severely misleading in all of its parts and all of its versions. But I haven't simply been using the egalitarian freedom movements as counter evidence to the great separation story. I have also been presenting them as extensions of a heritage with which I identify and with which you might reasonably identify. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. Now, you can see that we have not just one distinguished American academic for our discussion, but four. And we have <laughs> Professor John Bolan. He is the Robert L. Stewart Associate Professor of Philosophy and Christian Ethics at Princeton University. Oh, sorry, Princeton Theological Seminary, specializing in Christian ethics, moral philosophy, social ethics and criticism, and the history of moral theology. Then we have Professor G. Scott Davis at the end. He is the Lewis T. Booker Professor in Religion and Ethics in the University of Richmond. He's Professor of Religious Studies in Philosophy, Politics, Economics and Law, with an interest in Warcraft and the Fragility of Virtue, to quote the title of one of his books. And we have Professor Cornel West, who is Professor of the Practice of Public Philosophy at Harvard University. He's written 20 books and he's edited 13. True to the title of his chair, he is a prominent and provocative democratic intellectual, appearing frequently on TV shows and the cinema. He describes himself as a jazz man in the world of ideas. So this is the rest of our panel. I'm going to ask each of them to give about five minutes to uh, comment on the on the this lecture series as they've they've received it, uh, and so that you get a sense of, of who they all are and so on. And then we will proceed to open discussion. So let's start with John. And would you like us up there? Yes. I okay. Think okay. So. okay. Yes. <clears throat> So thank you, Allison, for that nice uh, introduction, and thank you for the Royal Society for hosting us. Um, it's, a, it's a great honor and pleasure to be at my friend and teacher's Gifford Lectures, Jeffrey Stout. Uh, what many of you may not know is that, in fact, all three of these men up here were my former teachers. I was a student of Cornell West's in 1982. <laughs> When he was a young assistant professor, unknown to the world at Union Theological Seminary, I knocked on his door as a first year MDiv student and said, may I have admission to your doctoral seminar? And he said, you quizzed me on what I had been reading. <laughs> and then you admitted me, <laughs> me and Jim Wetzel. <laughs> uh, and then that, the next year I, I started hanging out with Scott Davis, who was teaching at Columbia University at the, at the time, and his doctoral students. And then in 1985, Scott and Cornell sent me to Jeff to Princeton. So this is, these are my teachers. If I mess up tonight, <laughs> you know who to blame. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna make. John, I think you've misunderstood my teaching about self-reliance. <laughs> <laughs> actually, <laughs> that, that, that's actually my next point. <laughs> my, my, my third point is gonna be about that, actually, Jeff. 
<laughs> Very good. Um, so I'm gonna make, I'm gonna make three comments. So they're basically questions to Jeff and, and opportunities for him to elaborate a bit more. Um, when we talked about this panel earlier in the evening, we, we agreed this would not be simply us throwing questions at Jeff or the audience throwing questions at Jeff that we would talk among ourselves. Um, so I, I offer these questions to Jeff, but, but also to, to, to Cornell and to Scott for further reflection. The first is going to be about um, the genre of the lectureship as a whole, the kind of grand sweep that Jeff is um, describing, literally from Cicero to Cornell West. The second is going to be about friendship. And then the last, given Jeff's comment, is going to be about exemplarity and the scene of teaching that his lectures offer us, the audience. So first, grand narrative. Um, Jeff hinted at this in his opening remarks this evening, that there are many grand narratives of religion, ethics, and politics on offer out there these days. There are narratives of decline, decline into separation. If you think it's a decline, it might be uh, not a decline narrative. It might be the separation that you, that you desire. Um, there's decline into moral ruin narratives. There's decline from theologically robust accounts of the moral life to those secular accounts that are found in moral philosophy. So I'm thinking of, of the narratives of Oliver, Oliver O'Donovan, the narratives of Alistair McIntyre, the narratives of another of Jeff's student, the narrative of, of Jennifer Hurd. There are narratives of ascent, of climbing out of tradition, custom, and heteronomy into, into something called autonomy. I'm thinking of Jerry Schneewin's narrative in, the, in his great book, The Invention of Autonomy. And I'm thinking about all of this in the context of an essay, a 1984 essay um, by one of Cornell's teachers and one of Jeff's former colleagues, Richard Rorty, The Four Genres of Philosophical Historiography. One of the genres is the grand narrative. Um, and I, I'd, I'd like Jeff to reflect on whether and in what respect the, the sweep that you've given us, the historical sweep, is a kind of grand narrative that you're offering as an alternative to these others. Rorty says that grand narratives are designed not so much to get the facts right, I mean, this is the sticking point maybe, about each of the figures along the way, but to inspire, encourage, change the habits and sentiments principally of the young and thus move them to something else. And you, if you think about the way Alistair McIntyre's narrative of moral ruin has worked, at least in the United States. It's been one of moving the young people to do something. Um, you might not call it an, a narrative of encouragement. They would, interestingly enough. But anyway, if you could just comment about that. The second has to do with friendship. Um, I, I did a word search on the first three lectures. They're the only ones that I have in TypeScript, and friendship isn't mentioned much nor has it been mentioned much in the first two lectures. Maybe it's coming tomorrow, I don't know. Um, it but is It is coming tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so, but here's, here's my thought. I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Thomas guy, or at least one of the, the, one of the figures I work on is Aquinas. Um, a, you've used, Jeff, you've used Thomas's uh, idiom of the virtues to think about religion as a virtue, to tie it to piety and justice, linking that discussion to Cicero, who uses um, concerns about domination to distinguish true and false religion. So then this made me think about Thomas. So when Thomas discusses servitude, when he distinguishes the servitude that for him is dominative, a kind of slavery. It's in his commentary on the Gospel of John, John 15, where Jesus says to his disciples, uh, I'm no longer going to call you servants, but I'm going to call you friends. Now obey my law. Um, I'd just like to hear you talk about the relationship between the anti-domination politics, the inclusive, non-dominative politics that you're 
offering to us, and friendship. Justice has been prominent, but, but friendship's love hasn't been. I take it that civic friendship is an important aspect of the Republican tradition in which you're introducing us, and I'd just like to hear more about that. I mean, one way to, to think about the question is, if, if domination is the problem, if relationships deformed by domination are the problem, what's the alternative? For Thomas, it's friendship. And then last, um, I thought yesterday's lecture was um, very moving in all sorts of ways, particularly at the end. Um, and across the lectures, the, the, the six lectures, you've been giving us examples, persons to emulate. And you've, you've offered these persons to emulate, these figures, in a rhetorical style designed to make those figures vivid for emu emulation. Now, maybe this is too personal, but I'm, I'm wondering whether you think about your own lectureship, your own vocation as a teacher, the lectureship as a scene of instruction, borrowing Cavell's phrase, um, as itself offering a, a portrait or a figure for emulation and what that might be. Um, you, said, you have said repeatedly uh, in, the, in the lectures, and I, and I know in my many decade friendship with you, you've said repeatedly that part of your vocation is offering hope to the young. Um, you're offering this narrative and the figures inhabited in it, in part for that hope, but I, I take it you're offering yourself as well. And it'd be interesting to hear you talk about that. So anyway, thank you. Thank you very much. Everybody's solicitous of me because I'm crippled these days and they don't know what to do about it. The best thing to do is just let me move slowly and ignore it, I suppose. Um, I, I took my task here to say something provocative, and in thinking about that, I decided I would try to you know, sketch out a way in which these lectures look to someone, me, who comes at things always from an odd angle, from an angle that wasn't trained in an ordinary way by ordinary people and uh, still doesn't seem to be able to see things in the ordinary way. Um, Stout sometimes, talking about these things, gives the impression that I consider modernity to have been a mistake. Uh, but this is only partially correct. I consider the moral vocabularies of modernity to be mistakes, to be dangerous, destructive, and corrosive mistakes. And in my 30s, I realized that the resources of Aristotle, specifically the ethics, the politics, and importantly, the rhetoric, were the best language that had ever been devised for interpreting the way that we ought to try to understand our lives together. Right. I realized somewhat later that even in its unorthodox Christian version, this Aristotelian idea, particularly as found in Thomas Aquinas and as realized by the Spanish second scholastic, provided a brilliant vocabulary for understanding the wickedness of the Western conquest of the New World and the ways in which we ought to reflect on the destructiveness of those ways. The Stoic humanism of Grotius, which replaced that second scholastic, seemed to my mind to be merely a stepping stone between the Tacitian reasons of state and the Hobbesist vision of a Leviathan 
And the social contract seemed to me to devolve too easily into a justification for the self-interests of the policy-making elites. And therefore, for me, it seemed like Aristotle was enough, and we ought to just try to encourage people to get back to that, right, and say snotty things about the people who came afterwards, which I spent a fair amount of time doing. Um, <laughs> Because I thought Aristotle was enough, I never felt the need uh, to await the second coming of Trotsky or St. Benedict. Um, but in my 50s, I came to believe that the major impediments to the recovery of Aristotle were not in fact the ethical vocabularies of modernity, but the epistemological vocabularies of modernity, specifically the philosophies of science that identified with Cartesian rationalism on the one hand and Humean empiricism on the other. And so I was happy to make one with all of those people looking to uh, bring back the pragmatist tradition. Right? And so now that I'm old, I'm just waiting, as Lawrence Ferlinghetti might have said, for a rebirth of the wonders of pragmatism and for everybody else to catch up. Now, this would seem to place me somewhere, for those of you who heard yesterday's lecture, among Stout's small bands whether they're the elitist bands of Dick Rorty's Orwell in uh, Pleasures or Alistair McIntyre's Virtuous Remnant. But I've always followed the smart marks in thinking that any band that welcomed my membership would be one that I did not want to belong to. <laughs> And so I've come to think of myself as kin to Melville's Ishmael, Conrad's Marlowe, <clears throat> excuse me, and ultimately to Raymond Chandler's P.I., a kind of hired gun out to get whoever is pretentious enough to stick his head up and challenge the Aristotelian or the pragmatist way. Now, in part, this kind of quasi-romantic self-image is a function of the difference between Stout's youth and mine. Unlike Jeff, I grew up in a California divided between the new left and emergent Reagan uh, conservatism. It was a sad period. <laughs> Both of these seemed to me to be waddling down the path toward political and social authoritarianism, and that was a path that I obviously didn't want to head down. The language of faith, piety, and vocation was never available to me. I was so far out in left field that I didn't even know what a Lutheran was when I was 17. I'm not sure I actually know now, but <laughs> I, they've tried to tell me, and I'm, I'm you know, receptive. And so that language didn't appeal to me either. Thus, while I'm happy to embrace Jeff's version of history and his reassessment of political theory, I remain an outsider. I'm happier knocking off the latest academic pretender than joining a movement. And I'm at least willing to think that I'm not alone in being an outsider to these things. And so I'm not exactly hoping, but I'm at least wondering if tomorrow's lecture may bring me into 
eightfold uh, for the first time in my history. And if not, what do outsiders like me have to contribute to this ongoing discussion? Thank you. This is a very special blessing for me because this is a very special moment in my life. It was 44 years ago that I first met my dear brother Jeff Stout at Princeton University. And in those 44 years, he has become closer than a friend, closer than a brother. He's a soulmate. It's a rare thing in your life when you move from your mother's womb to tomb. And to be able to sit, to stand here and to say a few words about his magisterial lectures that are so deeply rooted in his own critical self-inventory, if I may invoke a phrase by Antonio Gramsci. And it reminds me, in fact, of John Dewey's quest for certainty in the late 20s, a critical self-inventory, a genealogy of his own vocation. Similarly so for Reinhold Niebuhr in the late 30s, the nature and destiny of man, a critical self-inventory, a genealogy of his own vocation. And now we have Jeffrey Stout, 2017 in catastrophic times, not just in the American empire, but in nearly every corner of the globe with escalating right wing populisms and atavistic nationalisms and neo-fascisms becoming more and more popular. What is required is what Max Weber, Sheldon Wolin called a wrestling with our vocation tied to the invocation of those antecedent figures figures who are exemplary. We live in a moment of market-driven celebrity, but Jeff is talking about morally laden exemplarity, qualitatively different. And the fact that, the note of piety, that I have been so deeply dependent on him, that we in conversation, mutual reciprocal dependent on each other, that sense of the sources of good in our existence and some of the catalysts and causes of our progress in life. And of course, anytime I talk about Brother Jeff, I always want to invoke my dear sister Sally, who has been so kind over the 44 years as well, and Noah and Susanna and Levy. Penelope Jane now and Miles. It's a family affair in the language of Sly Stone. And we're part of a family. And when I listen to Jeff's lectures, there's eloquence at the center, but it's eloquence as defined by Cicero and Quintilian, wisdom speaking so that his scholarship and his erudition is subordinate to the wisdom. That's very rare in a highly professionalized, specialized, corporatized discourse in the academy. An academy more and more characterized by careerism, obsession with upward mobility as opposed to old style questing of truth goodness, beauty, and for Christians like myself, holy, the holy. Now, it's fascinating to me that Brother Jeff, as a secular brother, comes to Edinburgh to unleash an ideal of ethical religion for both religious and secular folk. He is the most secular thinker who is religiously musical. That's very rare in our time. In fact, you got a lot of Christians who are not religiously musical, but we won't go into that. <laughs> so tied to dogma and doctrine and so tied to the next position, they forget about what are the costs of discipleship. 
What kind of sacrifices are you willing to make in the quest for your conception of what the kingdom is? If that kingdom of God is within you, are you leaving any heaven behind? That's the language of vocation. And that's the language of Jeff Stout as a secular brother, but connected to something that's rare. Even these days, which is his sensitivity to egalitarian freedom movements that begin with the struggle against white supremacy. That's why Martin Luther King Jr. and Fannie Lou Hamer and Ella Baker and Malcolm X and James Baldwin and Ralph Waldo Ellison is so shot through, not just his discourse, but his life. What is it to look at the modern world through the lens of egalitarian movements, but begin with white supremacy? Lo and behold, you will find yourself talking about empire. And then he connects it to the feminist movements, the Jane Addams and the Elizabeth Statins, the, the, the Elizabeth Cady Statins and others. The labor movement, oh, how significant it is, talking about class and greedy bosses, talking about the reign of capital over labor and connecting it to issues of white supremacy and male supremacy and homophobia. This is not cheap PC chit chat. This is a serious genealogy of a vocation of an intellectual who refuses to be a mere academic and to lay bare his scholarship to the populace, to the demos. And it's true that I, Sister Allison said, I call myself a jazz man. Or a blues man, and what is distinctive about a jazz man and a blues man, very similar to my brother Jeff, is that it's not just the finding of one's voice, but it's kenosis. It's the emptying of yourself given the gifts and the voice that you have to try to leave the world a little better than it was when you arrived. My brother Daniel knows George Clinton's in Glasgow tonight. You watch that brother empty himself at nearly 70 years old. The dialectic between Jeff Stout with the Edinburgh Lectures and George Clinton in Glasgow is no accident <laughs> because they both have a voice, a vocation. They use the gifts that they have in order to make it available to a demos and they believe in the capacity of that demos to do exactly the same thing. The Emersonian perfectionism that says one's calling is to first recall what has gone into oneself at, in the best sense, to keep track of what has gone into oneself in the worst sense, and then to attempt to ascend to a better self, knowing it is a perennial process. It is always incomplete, always unfinished, just like any fragile democratic experiment. And Jeff's project, in the end, he is a profound commitment to the democratic idea that everyday people, if rightly given access to cultivation, education, maturation, can govern themselves at the workplace, in the cultural sphere, in the churches, mosques, synagogues, and others, so that inclusive non-domination remains not simply an ought and an ideal, but rather becomes a force in the world. If there's one way of zeroing in on the core of my brother Jeff's project, it is the last line of Ralph Emerson's experience. The true romance of the world exists to realize the transformation of genius into practical power. That's what sits at the center of not just these lectures, but of my brother's life, his work, his witness. And I can tell you from close up, it's a sublime thing to see. 
uh, in, in these ad-libbed words, I, I'm going to work up to George Clinton. I'm not going to go right there. <clears throat> I'm, going, I'm going to just uh, mention a few things, and then we can open it up. The, uh, the value of these remarks is to throw many wonderful all of them relevant topics um, before all of us for discussion. Let me start with the issue John Bolin raised about um, grand narratives. Most of the grand narratives that I have spent a good deal of my um, intellectual life criticizing are grand in a number of respects, but one of them is that they have mega subjects. The protagonists are virtue or humanity or modernity or tradition. I'm suspicious of those, um, in part because, to take modernity as an example, I, I don't think modernity is a person. I don't think it's person-like. I think of it as a vast scene, extended temporally and geographically, in which all kinds of things have happened. Okay. So to try to treat it as a mega subject, or to treat tradition as a mega subject, and then modernity as its decline, already gets us off on the wrong foot. Now, when I in this uh, in this series of lectures, I have done something that is, that has a grand historical sweep. This is true. But when I say um, religion unbound, ideals and powers from Cicero to King, this will become clearer tomorrow, I hope. What I'm trying to do is to understand King's letter from Birmingham jail. Okay? And I am tracing one of several lines of historical influence that help me contextualize and understand why that letter mattered so much to me when I first read it in 1963. Okay. Now, it so happens, and I'll, 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 I'll say this briefly tomorrow, it so happens that this vast project trying to make sense of that historically by tracing a path that leads circuitously from Cicero and Livy to that destination, which of course is a path that can be seen only retrospectively, is only one of the paths that's required for getting a full contextualization of even that one piece. So part of what's going on in that piece is a distinction between ethical and unethical religion, and I'm trying to understand where that comes from. A number of other things happen in that letter. There is a, an appeal to natural law. There's a long tradition of natural law that would need to be thought about. Um, King was a product of uh, a curriculum that gave him access to one important variety of something called personalism. Personalism, in the variety that was available to him at Boston University, and in the various other varieties that are, were floating in Europe at the time, say, that Adam Michnik was in jail deciding to write something that echoed the letter from Birmingham jail. So Miknik was in Poland opposing, as a, as a key figure in the solidarity movement, opposing Soviet oppression of Poland. 
Cornell and I were at a lunch, it occurs to me, we're at a lunch one day with Meekney. And he said, you know what? He, he, he doesn't speak English very well, so there was an interpreter helping us. He said, um, this might be surprising to you, but be, because the Soviet authorities thought of King as an anti-American figure, as a critic of America, uh, they let us read King. <laughs> he wasn't on the censorship list. <laughs> And so when we, so when the very young Adi Miknik at the age of 17 or whatever it was, founded, what was it called, the Club for the Noticing of Contradictions or something like that, <laughs> uh, one of the main things that they were getting to read was Martin Luther King and the notion of dialogue that resonated in King's version of personalism and the form of um, uh, the discussion of dialogue as a central personalist concept in European, largely Catholic, um, uh, theology and philosophy. Um, this is another thing that would need to, so if you, if you want to get a full sense, even of the one, the one piece, um, let alone give an account of ethical religion and, and all the relevant strands of it in the, uh, in the 20th century, you've got to do a lot more than I've done in these lectures. It seems sweeping, but uh, it's actually uh, quite delimited what I've been trying to do. Friendship. I, I said that I was going to talk about this a little tomorrow, a, a, a little. There's a line, I'll, I'll give you a, a foretaste of tomorrow's lecture. The end of the first paragraph says, I would like to know how to make friends well. Now let that vary the emphasis and you will see that's an Emersonian sentence. You've got a begin understand you don't have it until you get to the fourth possible reading but you know you get to two okay I, I want to know how to make friends well I want to know how to make friends well if they are falling into despair for example but let's think about the, um, there's a line in Oakshot about not seeking justice as the crow flies. We, we tend to think when we talk about justice about societal relationships on the whole, globally, nationally. We forget about the friendships among the friends of justice that have to be set right if anything is going to be set right. And part of what I'm trying to do in these lectures is actually to think historically about the friends of justice as networks of friendship that extend through time and across very wide geographical spaces. This is one of the reasons for moving back and forth across the Atlantic in multiple directions as the, uh, as the lectures unfold. So take the abolitionist case, um, that's, a, that's a network of friendships. And, there, and when I referred to Benize and Clarkson as great organizers, I'm talking about people who knew what it meant to build relationships among people who share common loves. I won't be able to talk enough about King tomorrow to lay out the different notions of love that I think are actually at work and not fully captured in his own paragraphs on love. But when he speaks of the beloved community, he's actually speaking of a form of eros in which 
human beings, and he's addressing human beings as people who have a yearning for proper union with others. It's, it's only thematized in that phrase, the beloved community, that we're so familiar with. Not, it's not well discussed when he talks about the Greek notions of love. There's also the notion of agape, which he does emphasize, and there his sense of the significance of sacrifice um, is another thing I've tried to lift up in this long tradition. Exemplarity. Well, here, here's, do I think of my vocation as a form of example setting? Um, increasingly, yes. And that's both in teaching and in lecturing. And if I, if I may be pardoned um, the sort of personal remark you might have been inviting, I thought that one major flaw in my teaching back in the 1980s was that, I mean, I, I found my, Cornell and I taught a course together and I, I kept thinking the, the students aren't understanding me. Like they don't, like they understand the sentences I'm speaking, but they don't know where I'm coming from. And I first, my initial instinct was to think that that was something wrong with them. Like they were, they <laughs> <clears throat> and I, what I realized was that there was something wrong with me that I didn't understand well enough the, the significance of living at them in a way that made clear to them what I stood for. Once I started doing that more self-consciously, and the, you know, if anybody helped me do that, it was reading Emerson, because uh, Rediscovering Emerson, after he's one of my adolescent heroes when I was in my teens, but then rediscovering him in part as a result of uh, Cornell's American Evasion, but of philosophy, but also the work of George Kateb and David Bromwich and Stanley Cavell. They all helped me learn how to read Emerson better. And once I got that, I began to see that this writer was talking about exemplarity on almost every page. That's the way I started to read it. And that began to help me think about what I was doing and what my vocation was. It occurred to me that what Emerson was doing was trying to think through what great transformations are at the personal level and at the societal level. He thought he was living through one at the societal level. He was trying to figure it out. So to put it in academic terms, he's a theorist of great transformations. That's all theories of religion are really theories of something else. His is a theory of great transformations. And um, this goes to a point that Scott raised about what happens to people um, like him in this picture. Um, one of the most interesting things about Emerson's work on this topic is what, once you start viewing his corpus as largely about this, then you start to see that essays, lectures like the conservative, the reformer, the poet, and so forth, are descriptions of roles that can be, but it's, notice, the conservative is in, is among the roles being described. He has a role for, right? It's not that everybody is going to play the same role. It's not that everybody is going to be, um, you know, in the phone tree <laughs> when calling the next meeting. What he's trying to do is to find, a, find an excellent way for people of various kinds to be. 
and to think about what that might be in relation to a great transformation. Here's the thing about great transformations, according to Emerson. They happen. <laughs> okay? It's not, it's not like there's a question about whether they're going to happen. There's one happening. So now the next question is, well, how is one going to relate to that? Now, that might involve joining you know, a tightly knit band of friends who are going to demonstrate at the next meeting, but maybe not. Um, let me skip ahead to Cornell, and I'll try to be brief here because we want to have time for questions. Um, at the very end of his remarks, uh, Cornell West mentioned the final line of experience, the Emersonian essay which is about the transformation of genius, that is to say, the transformation of intuited ideals into practical power. One of the most important lines in Cornell's written works, from my point of view, in terms of its impact on me, was a footnote in the American evasion of philosophy that highlighted that line. And what that footnote, and it seemed to me that he had buried the jewel in the, <laughs> in, in the books. Uh, um, what he had intuited and then revealed in that line was that that line in Emerson, the final line of that essay, that's the beginning of American pragmatism. And that if you want to understand American pragmatism, you have to understand it not as a theory of truth as like um, truth is what your pals will let you get away with saying or truth is what um, would be productive to think. No, no, no. What it's about is connecting what you're thinking and feeling, especially in relation to ideals, with actually embodying those ideals in the world. So that, you know, if that embodiment doesn't happen, in some way, it doesn't have to be in a single way. If it doesn't happen somehow for you, something's wrong. Then I go back and I reread that essay. I spent something like 20 years trying to figure out that essay by Emerson. And I realized that a key to it is that when he's talking about the relation between his own earlier idealism and the material practice of slavery, he was describing his social world as one in which there are a bunch of people who are kind of personally committed to ideals, and they withdraw from the world in order to maintain the purity of those ideals. And over here is this material practice that is has no ideals in it. It's like, those two are living parasitically on each other. That it's a, like, that's one world. It's the world that has those two aspects, each of which is living each other's death. So the question is, what would it be to be committed to ideals and to create a material practice that was embodying them. That's the central question of the pragmatic tradition, as I think Cornell rightly understands it. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of you. I mean, that just opened up the, the subject in, in ways which I don't think we could have hoped for. It's been excellent. Um, and it, it's also sort of brought us into the, the, the tension and the, and the relationship between what goes on in the academy and life outside there. So, mm -hmm. But we're in the academy, in a sense, just now. And so I'm hoping that some people have been thinking of questions to ask. We have roving mics. Um, if you would like to ask a question, please put your hand up and uh, say, say your name and uh, we'll 
take it from there. Any questions? Yes, gentleman here. Uh, my name is George. Yes. Thank you. This is so inspiring. Uh, I've got two questions, one for Dr. Stout and the other one for Dr. West. Dr. Stout, uh, talking about egalitarianism, in your lecture yesterday, you talked about Emerson's concept of democratic individuality. How would you contrast Emerson's democratic individuality with Hegel's absolute idealism? The Boston personalist or Boston personalism rejected Hegel's absolute idealism because it undermined individuality and the inherent dignity of the individual but the concept of collectivism. Uh, Dr. West, what are the salient points of prophetic pragmatism that we can implement in the era of Trump? And uh, on a scale from one to 10, <laughs> would you now at least give an eight to Obama? No. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> the, brother, the brother did not grab money, power, or the presidency. And he was not perfect, but at least he kept Michelle in the White House. Thank you. <laughs> Who wants to go first? You answer this question all the time. Jeffrey. Well, I... I um... <laughs> Uh, the, 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 George's question to me was, um, how does Emerson's notion of democratic individuality relate to Hegel's absolute idealism? There are many readings of what Hegel's absolute idealism is. On my reading of Hegel's absolute idealism, which is not the same as the one that led to his rejection by, uh, by the pragmatists, for the most part. Um, what Hegel was trying to achieve in the phenomenology of spirit was something very close to what Emerson was trying to achieve in uh, 19th century New England. That is to say, um, when you get to the end of chapter six in the Phenomenology of Spirit, that's the one called, that's the chapter called Spirit. At the end of it, that's where something Hegel calls the emergence of absolute spirit happens. What's that? Why does it happen? It happens when two figures, one of whom begins as hard-hearted, as a hard-hearted judge, and the other, well, they, 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 they can't, these two figures can't get on the same page. They are accusing one another. One of them's taking excessive pride and uh, mm. in purity, and the, so don't need to give you all the details, but what happens? What is it that brings absolute spirit into view? One of them confesses and the other forgives. When one confesses and the other forgives, and they then can both do this, at that moment they are each is recognizing the other as simultaneously a loci of authority and responsibility, and each is recognizing him or herself as such. That is the form of sociality that he then describes as absolute spirit. That's exactly the sort of social relation that Emerson describes in his essays on reformers when describing what democratic individuality and sociality involve. Now, that's a non-standard reading of both figures. But I think it can be vindicated. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
Carnell, you want to? No, I mean, I the reason know. why I would give my dear brother Barack Obama a 4.5 out of 10 is because I look at my dear brother Barack Obama through the lens of the very traditions that Brother Jeff is putting forward. We know he had Martin King in the Oval Office. That upset me intensely, precisely because as a president or head of an empire, no matter what color they are, we want more than just poise and intelligence and a beautiful wife and two lovely children who happen to be black in a White House built by black slaves. He pushed through a health care bill that was a bonanza for insurance companies and big pharmaceutical companies. It added fellow citizens to the health insurance list so they had access to health care. I applaud that. It left out 22 million. It added 20. That's wonderful. 4.5. But then, when he meets with Wall Street, March 2009, what did he say? I stand between you and the pitchforks, but I want you to know I stand with you. I will protect you. Not one Wall Street executive went to jail given massive criminality and insider trading, market manipulation, predatory lending, fraudulent activities, Wall Street connection, bailout, Main Street, nothing. Just last year, he dropped 26,172 bombs on seven Muslim countries. He's got the Peace Prize, 12,000 on, on Syria, massive national security, national surveillance expanded under Barack Obama. One out of two children who are the same color as you and I live in poverty in the American empire that increased under Barack Obama, no matter what color he is. I'm, I, I'm, I'm excited when I see a black person break through the glass ceiling, but I have ethical criteria in terms of their deeds and their policies. I bring serious king-driven and Christian-informed critique to the head of any empire, no matter what color. So he's lucky to get 4.5. <laughs> <laughs> There's a question here. My uh, uh, name's Douglas Hall. I just want to pick up on uh, uh, some of the themes of the interconnection between religion and politics, mm. democratic uh, development, and modernization. I'd be interested in the team's reaction to something I wrote to Theresa May when she became Prime Minister in the UK context, where in the UK, one strand of Christianity, the Church of England, has a, an official position in the House of Lords within the political system. And the 21st century, my suggestion is that, that is not an age where that should be allowed. And that, so that, that established church should be got rid of. But if there was an alternative, and I'm thinking of the UK, but I think it could apply in America. If there was a consultative forum where all faiths present within the community were encouraged to be represented. Uh, I think that would encourage the voice of the majority, which wants peace, and it would encourage uh, the, the, the point about friendship between religions. So I wonder what the panel think of a consultative forum associated with the political process, but not having a formal position within politics. Can we have another question as well? And we can take the two of them together. This Hello, um, my name is Joanna, um, and I was really struck by that final sentence that both uh, Professor West and Professor Stout um, from Emerson, that genius, ideal genius, um, made into material form, and um, was really struck by, for someone who's doing a PhD in systematic Christian theology, how that sounds like the incarnation to me, um, and how the exemplarism that we've been talking about as well points to that, and so I'm wondering... First of all, what you think of that, and also whether that means that if that sentence points to the birth of American pragmatism, whether American pragmatism is then asking a question that the Christian tradition has an answer to at its core, um, and whether they're looking for something that the Christian tradition is saying it's here. Um, I'm just wondering how those two things interact in, in your readings of them. Good. Okay, who wants to go first on consultative forum or on Christian? Um, 
So regarding the first question, I, you know, I don't know anything about the UK scene. So I'm not going to answer that question in that respect. I know about the American scene. So, I mean, we, we certainly live in an age uh, in, in the United States of disestablishment. There was a, a Cold War political establishment that had um, a religious establishment giving it legitimacy, providing it with a moral vocabulary. It was basically the, the, the religion of the mainline churches. Um, I think the story goes that at least in the United States, that Cold War establishment started to decay in the early 1970s, and basically nothing has replaced it. Right? I think for, for, for a generation at least, we've been living without a political establishment giving a sort of political coherence to, to American political life. I mean, I think one of the, I mean, I'll let Jeff speak for himself, but I think one of the motives of Jeff's story, I still think it's a grand narrative, we'll have to talk about that, <laughs> um, uh, is to, to, in some respects, give um, uh, a certain sort of inspiration to, to the young and to those of us who are looking for a, a different sort of way of thinking about religious ideals and politics. I think embedded in Jeff's account of religion as a virtue is the recognition that basically no political society that's successful, that sustains itself over time and performs in a just way, no political society like that can, can survive, can be sustained, can be just with some, without something like a religion. Now Jeff stipulated that religion can have uh, an expressive and formative function and we'll call religion whatever that is. Um, I'm completely on board with that, but at least in, in the States, we don't have any agreement about what that is. It sounds like in the UK, you don't either. <laughs> or, or at least you're, you're entering an era when that's up for grabs as well. In the United States, we have, a, we have a, a phrase for that. It's called the culture war, when that's up for grabs. Um, but I think one of the lessons of drawing on the Ciceronian Thomistic kind of tradition of civic republicanism is that successful political communities, just political communities, need something like that, mm -hmm. whatever you call it. So you offered an alternative. I, th I take it Jeff is offering an alternative as well. We'll have to kind of see what comes. Mm -hmm. But uh, look, when, when, when states nowadays try to make provisions for this, right. things don't go very well. Right. So part of, what I, uh, part of what I've been studying in the, in the last dozen years or so is how grassroots action generates coalition building among religious and other organizations. And just watching how that works out in particular places. That's not, that's not, um, well, let, let's draw a contrast. Obama had a, um, a religious outreach thing, a formal one. Hmm. The outreach was entirely to people who weren't engaging in democratic coalition building. The outreach was to, uh, was to churches that were essentially depoliticized. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that the old establishment. <laughs> and what that did indirectly was to reinforce the depoliticization of the relevant religious communities. Whereas on the other hand, there were um, all through this period, there, below the radar, there are citizens' organizations being built up among, uh, uh, among religious communities, figuring out ways to cooperate among themselves. That's one element of the sort of studying friendship at the level of detail. <laughs> it needs to come from the ground up if it's, going to, if it's going to be democratically wholesome. Does anyone want let me, to let, me, to come? let me add a, a, a little piece to that. Uh, I have no objection to religious people getting together and having fun <laughs> and talking with each other. It's the idea that somehow a forum ought to be created for them as part of our political world that makes people like me nervous because I'm typically inclined to think that they're going to be talking humility and human rights and, you know, all those things that I don't understand. 
And this is going to drive me and other little uh, marginal people even further into the margin, which makes it even more difficult for me to uh, be noticed and brought back into any sort of fold by friends with whom I happen to disagree. Right. Disagreeing with friends is something I do all the time. Uh, being on the outside from publicly constituted groups is something that makes me want to stay away. By, not state, to be, by, state, by state, by state constituted state groups. Yeah, that's right. There's a contrast between what I, what I was talking about are, are politically constituted groups, like it's uh, groups constituted through political activity on the part of on the part of people and communities. <clears throat> that's a different thing from the state. nasty aspect of when, when, when states get in the business of that, they are typically in the business of, of helping something along that will help them along. And that means maintaining the current distribution of power, not challenging it. John, did you want to talk about the, um, the incarnational question? Please. I was going to say just a quick word about that. I'd like to read your dissertation when you finish it. But that last line is a complicated line. And on the one hand, you've got the Aristotelian legacy of Athens that's always talked about embodiment. You remember the conclusion of a practical Aristotelian syllogism. It's not a proposition, it's an action. So that particular strand within the rich tradition that flows out of Athens is already there. And Emerson is a recipient of both of those. Now, the Christocentric legacy of Jerusalem, there's no doubt that Emerson is a liberal Protestant who left but much of that tradition never left him. So in that sense, he's a lapsed liberal Protestant, you know, uh, uh, and, and, and rightly so. You know, in the same way that Jeff, Jeff had to leave the church in order to preserve much of the best of Christianity. There's a long history of that. <laughs> James Baldwin, we can go on and on and on. Uh, but, 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 but also, I think we have to take very seriously when you look at his readings of Plato and Montaigne, his readings of those figures who he views as his relative and his ancestor at the same time. You see the ways in which this transformation of genius into practical power sits at the center of not just his project, but what Dewey. In Dewey's essay of 1889, The Ethics of Democracy, is precisely about the transformation of Christianity into the democratic socialist movement. And closer to home, R.H. Taney, another grand example of a democratic socialist who's understanding a Christianity that leads him to embodied action for the weak, the vulnerable, the poor, the orphan, and the widow. So we're, we're, we're emphasizing today only the last sentence of that essay. The last paragraph is, so e Emerson is definitely reworking the, the traditional doctrine of incarnation. That's what he's doing there. Absolutely. But in the overall project of the final paragraph, he's reworking Christian apocalyptic. So what he's talking about is a new marriage of heaven and earth. And the mm -hmm. same reworking of apocalyptic rhetoric was initiated by Emerson in his first book, Nature, which is fundamentally a work of apocalyptic. All of this outside the church. Emerson's heresy is Montanism. That is to say, his heresy is the, the his fundamental break from the Christian tradition as conceived in orthodox terms is the idea that any church, any institution, has the authority to hold the keys to the kingdom and to, and to draw the line between genuine articulations of the spirit and false ones. I think I'm going to draw this to a close now because, so that we can have a chance to, um, to speak to the various people on the panel outside in an informal way. And so if people have questions, they can still catch them uh, later on uh, after, after this session closes. It's been a really rich um, experience for all of us to be here and, and a very enjoyable one as well, feeling that we're, in a sense,
eavesdropping on a conversation that has been going on for a long time, as we can recognise, and is going to carry on in various ways, and not just a conversation, but actually lives led according to it. And so it's been a great privilege to be here and to, and to hear from everybody here. So I'm now going to ask Mona Siddiqui if she would come and give a vote of thanks. Thank you, Alison. So, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, it's an enormous privilege, but also a huge challenge to um, give a vote of thanks at this event. Um, and, I, and I hope that the few words that I'm going to say will do justice to both this event, but also the lectures that many of us have been fortunate enough to hear and witness over the last few days. So last night over dinner, Professor Cornell West and I was very fortunate, I was sitting between Geoffrey Stout and Cornell West. So it was spiritual feeding as well. Cornell West used the words intellectual integrity when he spoke of his friend Geoffrey Stout. And it stayed with me during the whole evening as I made my way home afterwards on a rather cold and empty train. How do we know and measure intellectual integrity? And what value should we put on intellectual integrity? It seems to me that this is the recognition of the need to be true to one's thinking, to be consistent in the intellectual standards one applies, to hold oneself to the same rigorous standards of evidence and proof to which one holds one's antagonists, to practice what one advocates for others. In other words, intellectual integrity is hard work and potentially lonely work. We have heard much um, about what Professor Stout calls religion talk. But as scholars broadly in the field of religion to society, we bring not only our academic training into our work, but perhaps most importantly, something of our innermost. That struggle which lies within us. And however much we try to define academia as objective, critically distant and abstract, our writing is shaped not only by what we research and think, but perhaps, just as importantly, by what we feel and what we know it's ethically imperative to say. When academics are also public intellectuals, their life is never confined to the university. Their reach is more expansive, their words must be more probing, not conforming to what has gone before, but always encouraging us to rethink and reframe and this is called intellectual courage. Yet in giving such prestigious lectures such as, such as the Giffords, what we also need is intellectual humility, having a consciousness of the limits of your knowledge, of your knowledge that, one may, that what makes us good scholars is the extent of our imagination, our ability to make the deepest and most profound concepts meaningful, but that we should also be aware of the limits of our viewpoint that despite speaking wisdom, all scholarship is subject to critique and debate. There is no one grand narrative. And to misquote J.M. Barry, academia as well as life is one long lesson in humility. We have seen today honest, is honesty and critical thinking at its best. The idea of a critical society dates back many hundred years ago but it was very pointedly called for in 1906 by William Graham Sumner, the great anthropologist, who emphasised in his seminal book, Folkways, that if a critical society existed, that is, a society in which critical thinking was a major social value, if such a society were to emerge, it would transform every dimension of life and practice. And this kind of society requires vision, but also action. And I think we have seen this today. And I just want to conclude on friendship, and I had no idea that friendship was going to be brought up, but I'm really glad it was because it's a pet project of mine. I want to co uh, conclude on friendship and fellowship and say something on what I know that many of us who have observed and appreciated during these last few days on the occasion of Professor Stout's lectures, his friends and colleagues who have accompanied him. C.S. Lewis said that friendship is unnecessary like philosophy, like art. It has no survival value. Rather, it's one of those things that give value to survival. 
And it seems to me that it says something about Geoffrey as a person and a scholar when his friends give up their time to be with him, to support him and to challenge him. I've realized over the years that maybe our closest friends are only those with whom we share an intellectual intimacy, something elusive but magnetic. But there is also a fellowship here, and fellowship is usually based on commitment, not just chemistry. It's about trust, collegiality, and giving back. It is a fostering of community and not just friends hanging out together. It has been humbling to see and hear this friendship, which after intellectual integrity, intellectual courage, intellectual humility, I would call intellectual warmth. Thank you. <laughs>